All right, take your Bibles, turn over to the book of Titus, chapter number 2, Titus chapter number 2. And when you find your place, if, you, if you're able to, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word, Titus chapter number 2, beautifully song written by Fanny Crosby, who as a little child was blinded through some medication, so really she never really did see. And, uh, but you know what? The way she wrote, she could see better than most people could ever see. As far as spiritual thing, beautiful, beautiful song, beautiful, beautiful words. Is it, it is on. All right, Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2. I'd like to read the whole chapter because it really kind of goes with what I'm preaching here. Notice in verse number 1, Titus chapter 2, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged woman, Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Keep in mind, Paul is teaching Timothy, this is what you're supposed to be preaching and teaching to the church. Sound doctrine is what he calls it. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. So he's going into the workplace now. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again. So he's saying, even if you've got a bad boss, you're supposed to be a good worker. Amen? Uh, not per- Somebody say amen. amen. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, being faithful, it means, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the, and here, of course, has been our text. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, that's the grace of God now, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, that's, of course, serious about God, uh, righteously, doing what is right, and godly, being godlike in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us for him, by us, for him, from our iniquity, save us, in other words, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a people that are God's special people. And then he says, uh, uh, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort, encourage. So talk about these things, encourage about these things, and if you'd have to, rebuke, but with all authority, the authority of God. Always recognizing this is, you have the authority to preach this because I gave you that authority. God gave us that authority, preachers, to preach that. And then he said, let no man despise thee, saying, make sure now, Titus, you're living what you preach, so that when you give the message, that you will, the message will not be despised, will not be taken lightly. We're talking about living grace, living grace. Father, help us. I always think of that verse every single Sunday morning as I get up and get ready for church to come. I think about the church of Antioch. I think about when Barnabas went to the church there in Antioch, and he was amazed at what God was doing in this Gentile church and how the the scriptures record for us to see that when he went to that church, that he saw the grace of God. He saw it in the lives of the members of that church. He saw what grace was doing in their life, and how grace was changing their lives, and that living grace was powerful. And praise the Lord, thank you for grace. None of us would be here uh, if it wasn't for saving grace. Now, Lord, we need to understand what living grace is and how much needed it is today in this present world. 
And the world is looking for Christians that have living grace, not just saving grace, but living grace. And that's certainly, Lord, a message for me and for all of us today. May we be trophies of your grace, Lord. May we be a testimony of your grace anywhere, everywhere, that people, when they see us, they know there is something so different about that man, about that woman, about that teenager, about that junior. Oh, Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Living grace, living grace. So we started last week talking about that, and we talked about the fact that, you know, the the great thing about grace is that, uh, number one, is of course that you don't have to work your way to heaven, but because of Jesus dying on the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace. Amen. Nothing we can do to get us saved. The only thing we can do is by faith, trust, and accept the finished work that Jesus did on the cross, and of course the resurrection. Amen? Yeah. And by the way, that also means that you're not only are you saved by grace, but you're kept by the power of God. And God keeps you saved. You can't keep yourself saved just like you couldn't save yourself. You certainly can't keep yourself saved. So we are secure in this wonderful, wonderful grace. But we talked about the fact that the devil can use that. And the devil can use that to get us to think, well, my goodness, I'm saved by grace. And boy, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm going to go to heaven anyways. And the devil sells some Christians this idea that it's not important how you live. And that is a big, fat lie. It is important. How we live. That's why I read the whole chapter. I never forget years ago, it really has only happened one time, met somebody, and I said, yeah, I'm Pastor Grandy from Faith Baptist Church. This was in California, and uh, he said, yeah, he said, I'm looking for a church. I said, great. Well, man, come on out and see us. And he said, well, he said, but I'm, let me tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking for a church that doesn't tell you how to live. I said, well, probably ought not come to my church then. Uh, but I actually said, I just said, and I said very kindly, graciously, I said, but listen to me. That's what most of the Bible is all about. It's about telling you how to live. What are the commandments all about? Telling you how to live. Telling you what to do and telling you what, what not to do. And so this idea, you know, that I'm going to go to church and I don't, want to have, I don't want to be told what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to live. I'm sorry, you can't preach the Bible without telling people how to live. And that's what chapter 2, he, told, he talked to, the, he talked to, the, to the aged men, the old men in the church. He said, this is, what, this is how you're supposed to live. Talk to the aged women, this is how you're supposed to live. Talk to the, um, the, the, the younger women, uh, because you've got to teach the younger women how to live. By your example, as the preacher preaches, and by your example, they learn how to live. And then teaching the younger women, you know what they're supposed to do. Supposed to love their husbands, love their children, uh, uh, keepers of the home, managers of the home, talks to the young men. This is how you're supposed to be a pattern of good works. You know, some idea, well, you know, uh, I'm young, so I really don't have to live for the Lord. Listen to me, if you, if you are alive and breathing, you're supposed to live for the Lord and you're saved. So a pattern of good works. You, you guys, you've got a secular job and you go to that job and you're a Christian, you ought to go there and you ought to live like a Christian. That's what he says there. So the whole chapter is talking about Living grace, how you, are you supposed to live as a child of God? Because it is important how you live. And I've said it over and over again. Paul wrote about the fact that we get the grace of God so God can make us trophies of his grace. So we can be te- God wants to be able to say, look at him and look at her and see how she's living for God and see how he's living for God. That's the whole purpose of grace. Grace is not just to save you. Grace is to change you. To change your life. So, we looked at the definition of grace. And the definition of grace, of course, it is unmerited favor. It is God willing to love you and save you, but you don't have to earn it. Because it's already been earned 
through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why he says salvation is, has been brought to all men. God brought his grace to us. And grace brings us to him so that we can be saved. But then we talked about, and this is where we ended up last week, but we're not done with it for sure. But then we talked about the distortion of grace. There is a distortion of grace. And thanks to the devil, there is a distortion. And thanks to the world, there is a distortion to grace. Now notice, go there, verse number 2, and let's kind of pick it up. And we'll, I'll kind of go through a little bit what I went through last week. Number 2, look at teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Now, the devil unfortunately has succeeded, I believe, in distorting grace. The devil figures if he can't get you to deny the grace that exists from God for salvation, then the next devil's not done then. If, he, if you got saved by grace, he, man, he, he lost you. He didn't want you to get saved. He, he wants you to die and go to hell. That's what the devil wants. But if you get saved, then he has plan B. There's a plan B in this. Certainly the last thing, you, he, he doesn't want you to get saved. But if you get saved, now he doesn't want you to live like you're saved. He doesn't want you to be a testimony of his grace. So, if he can't get you to deny grace exists from God for salvation, then his next step is to distort grace and get you to deny that grace teaches you how to live. Now, for us to be a testimony of the grace of God in our life, Paul personified grace. He said, the grace of God teaching you. So he literally makes grace like a, a person, and this person is a teacher. Or really, when you look at the word teaching, it's more as a parent, as a parent. Teaches their, their son or their daughter. They teach them how to live. At least if you're a good parent, you teach your kids how to live. And you teach them how to live right. Right? so that they can have a, a good life. And so that's what grace is for. Spurgeon, in talking about grace, said that we have a choice. That we can live our Christian life in third class or first class. Because even back in that day, they had boats where they would travel and there was a third class where you would stay usually at the bottom of the boat. If anybody have been on a cruise? Anybody been on the third class rate of a cruise? What, you go in there, and it's a cabin down at the bottom. You open up, there's no windows, there's no nothing. It's a little bitty thing. It just probably, maybe just from, from here to, to about here to, to there and to there. little bitty thing. And, and if you're claustrophobic, don't go. Little bitty bitty thing. Now, but if you go first class, usually you're up on the top, you got a balcony, you can see the ocean, man, you got space, you can lounge out, you got a beautiful bathroom and shower. And so Spurgeon uses this analogy. He said, You have a choice as a Christian. You can either you can either go through life as a third class, living third class, or you can live first class. And that's what grace is for. Grace is to get, get you saved, but then also so you can live a first-class Christian life, and quite frankly, to enjoy the Christian life. So to do that, to keep us from living that, the devil distort, distorts grace, convincing us that how we live is, is not important, and how we live doesn't save us, so, hey, you know, don't worry about that, but that, again, is a distortion. So, what he says is grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, and then it says no to worldly lusts. That's what grace will teach you. Once you get saved, grace of God work in, works in you, it is going to teach you to say no ungodliness. And no worldly lusts. One of the greatest enemies to the grace of God, living grace, working in our lives, is worldliness. That's one of the greatest enemies of grace working 
in our lives. Again, he's talking to people that are saved. He's talking to people that are going to heaven when they die. They know they're not going to lose it. But he tells them, all right, you're not going to lose it, but it is important that you understand you're not living to be saved, but you're living because you are saved a certain way. So look at 1 John chapter 2, if you would, verse number 15. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15. First John chapter 2, verse number 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So I, I don't have to, I mean, anybody who reads that understands that, right? That's a pretty simple verse. He says, don't love the world. And don't love the things, don't let your, your greatest desire be for the things of this world. And if you love the world, he says, then the love of the Father is not in you. Why? Because the love of the world is incompatible with the love of God. We've all heard the expression, oil and water don't mix. You, you get a bucket of water and you put a, a, a quart of oil in that water, it is not going to mix. You're going to have a blob of oil in that water. They never can mix. You can try, you can try, you can try, you can get a big old scooper and stir it and stir it and stir it, and you'll break up that oil. But once you stop and let everything settle, guess what you have? Big blob of oil and water. Why? Because oil and water doesn't mix. And I'm going to tell you, the world, the love of the world, and the love for God does not mix. You, can't, you cannot have both in your heart and in your life. Billy Sunday used to say, who was an evangelist back in the early 1900s through his preaching, is one of the reasons why prohibition came into America. When for a time there, uh, drinking was against the law. Making liquor was against the law because of the preaching of this evangelist. And here's what he said. He said a worldly believer or a worldly Christian is the same thing of speaking of a heavenly devil. It is a contradiction in terms. Again, what, is it, what does the Bible say? That grace is going to teach us, when it works in our living grace is working in our life, it's going to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Now, when God, the Bible talks about the world, let's make sure we understand. The Greek word for the world there is the word cosmos. It means a system, a system of belief, a system of, of value. So he's not talking about the trees. He's not talking about the mountains. He's not talking about the ocean. He, and he's not even talking about people in the world. You know what the Bible says? For God so loved the what? The world. That's talk, he's, he's not talking about the system of the world. He's talking about the people in the world. God loves the people that are in this world that are unsaved. You know why? Because that's why he sent his son to die for them. So they could be saved. So he's not talking about the trees. He's not talking about nature. He's not talking about all the beautiful things that are in this world, the animals of this world. He's not talking about the people in the world. He is talking about the world system. He's talking about the world's values. He's talking about the beliefs. And, the, and there was a time that you go back where a lot of the Christian Bible values actually had a had an influence on the world and and even unsaved people had had this influence in their life though maybe they didn't understand it that that there were there were christian values in this country that were very real and very powerful hey i you know just a kid but i remember on sundays 
nothing was open. Nothing. I, I, I remember my dad saying Saturday, boy, I got to go get gas. We're going to, to our, you know, to my father's and we're gonna, we need to get gas. Why? Because on Sunday, no gas stations are going to be open. I remember I had a go-kart. We drove to a big uh, a mall area. It was like a, uh, it wasn't a mall actually, it just had strip mall, strip mall, that's what it was. Had Kmart and did all these stores over here. I remember we drove down and we got out because the parking lot was empty on Sunday. And I could get on that parking lot and drive all over the place. Everything was closed. You know why? Because it was Sunday. And even then, and this is what, I'm 60? So what, 60 years ago? And some of you at my age, you remember those days. And I can go on about that. The powerful, inf- they were so careful to, on television. Uh, Dick Van Dyke and all these, these all show, they didn't even let them sleep in the same bed together. Husband and wife. They didn't want to appear that something was going wrong. But I thought, what's wrong with a husband and wife sleeping in bed together? Y- y'all get my drift? Y'all with me? So there was a time. But here's what happened. And you, we've all heard the statement, the world is getting more churchy and the church is getting more worldly. And they're trying to blend it together and think it's going to make a difference. But it won't. Why? Because the love of the world and the love for God is incompatible. They they will not blend. So whenever the Bible refers to the world, God is always saying to us, watch out. Watch out. Whenever the world is talked about in the In the New Testament, it's always watch out. Let me give you some of them. Number one, first thing we find in the scriptures concerning this distortion that that it's okay to love the world and love God, which it is not okay according to the scriptures, is number one, watch out for the prince of the world. Watch out for the prince of the world. Turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 12. Everybody doing okay? You know, preaching on the world kind of gets to us sometimes because... Let's face it, the world has a lot of traction to it, and it's very powerful. It's all around us. But look at John chapter 12, verse number 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the, what's the next word? Prince of this what? To be cast out. Who is the prince of the world? The the devil is the prince of this world. Not the world, the, 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 the trees and all the beauty of this world. He is the prince of this world system. He's the authority of the world system. And by the way, just so you know, God allows him to do that. Amen? God is still in control of that. Uh, Ephesians 2.2. Turn to Ephesians 2.2. We're going to use our Bible a little bit this morning. So, watch out for the prince of the world. He's he's in control of this world system. By the way, if you want to know if something's bad, look at the leader. How many say Russia's our friend? Well, just look at the leader. It's not our friend. How many would say China's our friend? Well, just look at the leaders. They're not our friend. Okay? Look at the leader. Notice what it says. Wherein in time past ye walked... Past tense, according to the course of this what? Of this world. Used to walk just like this world. But look what he says. According to the, what's the next word? Prince of the what? Of the what? Of the air. Now, that doesn't mean he controls the air that we breathe. Air is invisible. He's talking about the unseen world. He's talking about the powers that are behind what is taking place in this world. Now you better, we all Christians, we need to understand, I've quoted this verse so many times, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There is an unseen world, the prince of this world, Satan, the devil, 
is a prince of this world. He's in control of this world system. He is in control of the world's values. He is in control of the world's beliefs. And so all the things, and, and how many would agree, at least would you agree with this, this world is going to pot. And, 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 and the reason being is because, okay, we talk about, a lot of people talk about the president and, and America's having all these problems. Sometimes people say, well, because that's exactly what the president wants. I don't know for sure that that's what the president wants. But I'm going to tell you, who I do know what somebody wants. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants this nation to go to pot. This is a Christian. This was, was, was uh, the, the verdict was, the judgment was, the Supreme Court, and I think it's 1904, 1906, that the Supreme Court said, made the judgment that America is a Christian nation. And the devil wants to destroy all that. And how many would agree he's, he's doing a pretty good job? And so he is trying to destroy this thing, and he is behind all this, and the ruler of this world is Satan, he, and he wants to destroy anything that has to do with God. He is against, he is against uh, he, his beliefs are anti-God, are anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-church, anti-family, anti-truth. You wonder, why in the world is the family falling apart? Because that's what the devil wants. And that's what... And so he's in charge of the world, and he is leading the world to destroy the, great, the most important, the nucleus of society, of life, is a mom and a dad and children. Amen? And he's destroying that. He's telling, I, I heard in the news yesterday, a seven-year-old, uh, a mom says that uh, uh, his, her seven-year-old son is binary gender, which I have no idea what that means. So I think it means you're not a boy or you're, you're not a girl. You're just kind of something. We have children that are 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. That a boy thinks he's a girl. And public education says, you know what? We want to be able to help that boy or that girl become a girl if it's a boy or a boy if it's a girl. And, and, and we don't want the parents to have the say to say that he can't do this or she can't. Ladies and gentlemen, am I the only thing, person that thinks this world is crazy? Now, who's doing all that? Satan is. I know we get mad at our politicians. We get mad at the liberals. We get mad at the progressives. We need to get mad at the devil. We need to understand this is a spiritual battle. And that's one reason why churches like ours that are preaching the word of God are more important than, than anything else that's going on in this world. This, these, these are the answers to the problems in people's lives. And then not only watch out for the prince of the world, number two, watch out for the spirit of this world. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12. I am never going to get through these messages. Oh my, it's so important. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to go till 10 after here. Let's have a church vote. All in favor, say aye. aye. Anybody opposed? Don't say so. Okay? First Corinthians chapter 2. Now, we have received not the spirit of the what? Talking about us as Christians. But the spirit which is what? Of God. Notice, notice that we might, what's that next word? Know the things that are freely given to us of the world. Or, or, of God, what am I saying? I'm sorry. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> of God. Ephesians 2, 2, we read a moment ago, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh. God did not give us this. When you got saved, God did not give you the spirit of this world to control our lives. He gave us the Spirit of God to control our lives. That's what grace is for. Grace opens up the door that my spirit comes alive unto God, and the Spirit of God comes in me the moment I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me. Holy Spirit comes and takes up 
residence inside of you as a believer, whether you like it or not, God is in you. And that Spirit of God is there to control my life. That is a soberness he told Titus to say yes to. No to the Spirit of the world is what grace teaches you. And yes to the Spirit of God. That's what living grace is for and will do. You will not see, you will never have the Spirit of God inside, Holy Spirit of God inside of you leading you to love this world. Never. And to even think that, I'm trying to think of the right word, it is sacrilegious. To think that the Spirit of God would lead you to love this world. No. No. The Spirit of, wor- the, spirit of the world, and, the, and by the way, even Satan, Satan, all right, you got saved. All right. All right, you're saved. Now, don't be a fanatic about it. Okay? Don't, don't, get, don't let this thing control your life. There's a big old beautiful world out there. By the way, you want to see the, 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 the spirit of the world? Read 2 Timothy chapter 3. Read that. Love is a pleasure more than Lovers of God. Holy Spirit will never lead you to be a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Hey, I love pleasure. I love I like hunting. Amen. I like fishing. Man, I love it. I love cutting my grass. There's a lot of things in the world I like. But I don't love. And and it's never going to lead you to love this world. Okay, I'll give you a perfect example. I got saved. When I was in the military, I started drinking quite a bit. Drank a lot, actually. I remember I came home. And um, I I came home on furlough. On leave, rather. And I went and bought a case of beer, put it in the refrigerator. I remember my dad coming and saying, open it up and say, whose beer is this? And, and I said, it's mine. He looked at me, I'll never forget it. My dad wasn't saved. I didn't have a Christian home. He looked at me and he said, you're drinking too much. And he was right. And alcoholism was very prevalent in my family. And, and I think, I don't know, thank God I'll never know. I think I would have become an alcoholic. I definitely was going in that direction. My, my mother became an alcoholic. Her brother became an alcoholic. Her other brother became an alcoholic. Her dad was an alcoholic. So that, that was definitely in my genes to be a drinker. So I got saved. And I remember when they found out I got saved first, when I went home, I said, I'm saved. They said, that's great. You're going to church. That's great. And then I went to church on Sunday morning when I was there. And then I came back. And then I said, I'm going to church tonight. The, it was almost like, what, what are you doing? You're going to church on Sunday night? What, what is that you're holding in your hand? Uh, oh, a Bible. You, you, you're holding the Bible? We had one Bible in our house. It was under the chair in the living room. And that's where it stayed. I started going to church all the time. I mean, I, and I started not doing things. I used. Now, the, one of the things they loved is I didn't drink anymore. They were so happy. Joe, we're so glad you're not drinking anymore. I said, me too. But man, I just, I love going to church now. And, and, I'm, and I started going out, passing out tracts and giving to people. And I remember they finally got to the point, they said, now, you're taking this Christian thing too far. I mean, we're glad you're going to church, but all the time? And I, I'm not even going to tell you what they did when they found I gave 10% of my income to church. <laughs> oh, my soul. They said, what? I remember there was a time they wouldn't even send me money anymore. Because, and I'm not trying to put my family in a bad, they just didn't understand. Remember what I said last Sunday night? I was in an area where we, I didn't even know what a Christian was. If you said it's a Christian, I said, I, I have no idea what a Christian is. 
where I grew up, we knew nothing about Christians or Christianity. So they didn't know anything. And so when they thought about me giving 10% of my income, they were like, you are really, they thought I was in a cult. My family had a meeting. My brother-in-law and my sister who visits here will be here in September, October, will attest to that. My family had a meeting about me. Italian family, come on, man. And they had a meeting about me. And basically they said, you know what? We've got we've to kind of, kind of uh, ostracize you. And I hate saying that because I love my family so much. And they're, they're some of the most wonderful people you ever meet in your life. But they just didn't understand. Now, praise the Lord. Let me kind of just say, later on they were so glad that I'm a Christian. Amen. And, and, and they got saved. My dad got saved. Amen. I'm trying to say is... They, they were of the world, and they had the spirit of the world. And the spirit of the world is, Lord, we're so glad you're going to church on Sunday mornings only. But when they found out I was going Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, special meeting, they were like, you've gone over the deep end. And they said, I remember my brother and sister-in-law, my, my sister and my brother-in-law said, they said, but he'll get over it. Never have gotten over it, amen? See, here's what I'm trying to teach you, and, and I, I'm going to have to stop, and I hate it because I, I just can't wait to say what I'm going to say in the next ten points. <laughs> Listen to me. That's, what, that's the way the world is right the world doesn't mind churchy people. Don't mind that. Just don't get so fanatical that you're trying to get other people in the church. And you're, trying to get, and you're trying to be a testimony. You're trying to help people get saved. And you're excited about the Lord. And you're reading your Bible. And your life is changing. And you become a godlier Christian and a less worldly Christian. Please put this in your brain. And I'm going to prove it. If you'll keep coming and listen to me, I'm going to prove to you Worldliness is an enemy of living grace. It is the enemy of living grace. Don't you understand the world hates us? It hates us. It is never going to help us. It wants us out of here. It, it, the world cannot wait, though it doesn't realize, can't wait till the rapture. Because when the rapture happens, I, here's what's going to happen. Everybody's going to say, man, what happened to everybody? But boy, I'm glad these are the ones that left. That's what they're going to say. Man, these fanatics, they've been messing up. They, now we can do what we want to do. And if you don't mind me saying, that's when the world really goes to hell. The only reason why the world still has some stabilization to it, if you'll study it out, is because we're here, and because we're here, Holy Spirit's here, and the Holy Spirit's just kind of holding things back. He's just kind of making sure it doesn't too crazy for us down here. But when we're out of here, basically the Holy Spirit who held back everything is out of here. And you, you want to figure out what's going to be like? Go back to the book of Genesis and the days of Noah. That's the way it's going to become. So the question I have for you is, do you have the spirit in you that loves the world more than it loves God? And don't tell me you don't know, because you do know. Because if you're saved, the Holy Spirit's telling you right now. This world should not be controlling your life. Jesus should be controlling your life. God's grace should be working in you in such a way that you want church, you want the Bible, you want to live for God, that is the very desire of your heart. And I might just say this. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to say it. If you've never had those desires in your heart truly, and if you've just been going through the motions, it just might be that you are not saved. Because if you are saved by the grace of God, something is going to happen inside of you that you cannot explain but to say God did it. Because I certainly didn't want this to happen. I was happy in the world. I loved the world. 
I was having a great time in the world. And then God came in and messed everything up on me. But boy, he made, he, it was a good mess up. Amen? Are you saved? Are you saved? And don't just say yes. If you, were to call, if you had to go to court, I heard this years ago. If you had to go to court and the judge said, what evidence do you have, sir or ma'am, that you can give to me that proves that you are saved? What kind of evidence would you give them? What's the evidence in your life that truly says you're saved? Let's bow for prayer. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. I, I'm sorry, Lord. Boy, you know my heart, how much I want this truth that is so important because I love grace. I love what grace did to my life. I love the, what grace is doing in my life. And I just, I long more than I think anything else pretty much right now, I long to see the grace of God in Faith Baptist Church. So please, Lord, help us to understand that the that the that God says, watch out for the prince of this world. And he says, watch out for the spirit of this world. Because it's going to continually try to keep us back from being sold out for Jesus, living for God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, doing the very best that we can with the grace of God's help to live for him and to serve him and to help him with furthering the kingdom upon this earth. We're all different stages Certainly I understand that. I've been through every one of them. But Lord, help us to see what's happening. And oh, how I pray that, Lord, that we will not give in to the spirit and the prince of this world, but we'll give in our life. And Brother Listen's been talking about being conquered by the Holy Spirit of God in our life. That's my prayer this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder if you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Grandy, I am not saved. I know I'm not saved. Would you pray for me that I would be saved? I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But I know I'm not saved. That, I know that for sure. There's no doubt in my mind I'm not saved, but I want to be saved. Would you lift your hand up good and high that I might pray for you? Anybody like that this morning? How many would say, as a child of God, that you say, Pastor, I do not want the spirit of this world to control my life. I want the spirit of God to control my life. That is my testimony. That is my heart's desire. Would you lift your hand up good and high and say, Pastor Grant, that's my desire this morning. Amen. Lower your hand. I want there's somebody to say, Pastor, I want it, but it's just not really happening in my life right now. It's just not happening. Pastor, would you pray for me that the spirit of God would have control of my life? Because really, the spirit of the world has pretty much been controlling me. And I don't want that. I want the spirit of God to control me. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? Nobody else is looking? I'm the only one that's looking. Anybody at all? Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. Let's all stand together, shall we? Father, take the message. Use the truth. Help us to line upon line, precept upon precept. Help us to learn this most important truth because take, grace should be teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Not embrace it, but deny it.